Um, so I'll go, oh, we'll transition yeah. from that really quickly um, into basically how you view prospects in general. So one of the things that I find really interesting is you watch some of these guys. I watched Dalton Connect, and everyone talks about how a guy will scale up, but they don't always talk about how they'll scale down into different roles because your role in college is not always going to be your role in the NBA, or it's not always going to be your role in the NBA. And so sometimes you look at just the, you know, the, the top, top prospects, you know, and you're like, oh, this guy could be like a number one or a number two. But to your point, and especially with this draft, you have to look at like who can be an OG, right? Or who can be an elite role player at some level? And what does that look like, especially when you weren't? And I find the scaling down aspect is, I find it almost more interesting than the scaling up. But I just want your your thoughts on like, how would how do you sift through kind of not only just, you know, the data, I know some people like to immediately go and I, you know, I totally understand the advanced analytics, you know, original degree was in economics. So I have no problems understanding you know, the, the that side you're not going to get that battle from me so it's okay I, yeah I'm, okay I'm old school, so <laughs> I, I use numbers to help my evaluation i don't yeah I know, i'm I, not going I, on bartorovic right away to be like look i'm like no I, yeah i've seen test. some people like immediately they start like the very first thing they're looking at vorp and i'm like okay like can we at yeah. least start with a, like film or like a conversation about like actual play right so right. uh yeah uh how how do you kind of sift through that it's it's one of those things where you know i'm not trying to be like oh i have the it's my eye test like if i watch a guy for example last year i went and saw keontae george in person and i was just like <laughs> see you're, you're hitting all the right buttons if you yeah, just I'm talk about case and like, wallace then about? then you're you're hitting mine yes. too <laughs> oh Kaysen, Kaysen was on i was all in all year so there you go I, and i promise like i don't have all the answers but my batting average is pretty good so I saw Keontae last year in person and I was like, I'm in because I thought they were asking him a, to do a lot when it was coming. Like they're, he's running all over the place. He's moving. He's coming off screens. He's bringing the ball up. He's making plays. Like even when he's struggling to, with his shot, he was making great reads. And I thought watching their coaching staff, when I saw them, it was beginning of the year and watching their coaching staff interact with him where like he would take a bad hero ball shot. And it wasn't, he was heating up. It just took like a, a bad rush shot. They pull him out, sit him down, like talk to him on the bench. He'd come back in and immediately make two good passes for his teammates. Like, and seeing that I was like, situation is so important for this. And funny enough, like, I, you brought up Dalton Connect, which I think is a fantastic example with this class. He was their offense. Like he was everything. They they would lean on him for everything. And it's a transfer coming from Northern Colorado that's just like, okay, you're an SEC now. Roll with it. So a team's going to be saying, we're going to be having Dalton Connect as our third option early on. Like, and his life's going to be a little bit easier because he's not having to make this ridiculous shots and run off everything. I think it's always really important. And it's why even a guy like in this class, just like Keontae George played at Baylor, Jacoby Walter, like I was cooling on him, went back and watched his tape. And I was like, I'm getting the same five as Keontae. They ask him to do a ton. He's always running off of everything. Like the shot percentages struggled this year, but I see the talent. So I think it's, it's really important with situation, with understanding what teams are asking of these guys and, and why, you know, playing around more talent at the next level could almost be a breath of fresh air for them because they're like, all right, let's make my life simple early on. And then I could start to build out the rest of my game. But connect, I would say, for your questions, like the big one for me, where I think almost a lower usage and him not being the go-to guy might make it even more dangerous for him because he can just be a specialist that allows his confidence to keep building. Like, a lot of the a lot of people want to say like, oh, he's twenty three, he can't get better, and I'm like, what? I mean, what are we talking about? Like, guys are not. This is not the best version of them just because they're a senior. Yeah, um, I remember folks saying that before um, the great um, 03, I think it's the O three draft with LeBron. 
And there was even people murmuring with murmuring that about Wade. It's like, you know, that Wade guy, you know, from Marquette, he's pretty good, man. But you know, I ain't really sure he's that much growth left. It's like, I'm like, what? Okay. <laughs> you don't watch the tournament all year? Guys splitting double teams like this sleep. What are you guys talking about? But he's 22, you know. I mean, or the case of me, I'm not sure. I'm like, okay. But I think to your point, I think upper class may think well, to your point, Kenya, upper class may think they're gonna be able to adjust to that much easier. And some of the young guys are coming out, right? We, we got one right in our midst right now, right? I think that's one of the issues that kind of hurt Grady up front because Grady was asked to just be a spot-up dude. Grady wasn't built like that. He was like, Grady's used to be like, being like a second option at best in this case at Kansas running around doing the stuff we're just discussing. He's not sitting around sitting in a corner here just twiddling his thumbs and waiting to the last second. Oh, you're a release valve. Shoot. <laughs> and then we, had, we saw the struggles. And when he came back the next time, it looked like they learned a little bit from him. And he got a little more comfortable. And voila. You know, he started to blossom, but I think upperclassmen can handle that a lot easier, right? It was like, okay, well, you know, the like Hawkins was a dude in UCLA. Well, now yes. he's a guy, right? He's a, you know, he's a Miami system, plug him in, and we're off and running. So I think as we see more guys, I think more upperclassmen, the trend will be more upperclassmen due to the CBA uh, that Tyler mentioned, that guys are going to guys are gonna be like more, like more teams are going to look for upperclassmen because they're going to want the cheap options. Like, hey, you know what? He can play. That's a rotation player. I don't have to worry about looking for a free agent to go overpay for that. I can just go guess junior or senior and plug him in. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. And Miami has kind of led the charge on that. Whenever mm-hmm. they draft, drafting someone like Hawkins last year, you know, it's not going to shock me if they draft a junior or senior in this year's draft because they just want guys who are ready to come in and play now, especially if they believe their championship window is now. And like Tyler had mentioned about the CBA, that's going to be key in this as well moving forward. Um, for any of the draft picks, I think I was just thinking of a guy like last year in Philip Kowski and Kellel Ware or Kilio Ware, I believe maybe it's pronounced. Those guys last year were not may, maybe late first or second round. Now they're going to go top 20, probably the pair of them each in this draft. And they get a little bit more money, especially as it's being a flat draft, as we've spoken before. So it's like taking that extra developmental year for yourself can get you more money in the long run instead of right. having to go vote right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it's going to be interesting times, right? I mean, um, what's the name for Golden State? My dad's guy from Indiana from last year, in this case, Davis, right? He was he was watching Big Ten games, you know, interested in Edie, but he'll be watching Indiana. He's like, that kid can play. And my dad said, that kid can play. I was like, I don't know where he's going to go with the draft, but if anyone's smart, they should be picking him. And lo and behold, he's like literally the Warriors starting for half the season. Like, yeah, those type of guys are going to become more and more valuable over time, especially for teams like Golden State that are pretty much begging to get out of that second cap. <laughs> it's like, it's like an apron. They don't want any part of that. Those guys are going to be like gold to them. Yeah, there's always value. And I think this is the year, too, you're going to get guys like that where you could find them much later than – be, it, there's just so much difference right now. Like as I'm, I'm telling you guys, like asking around, there's so much difference with opinions of like where players should go. I'm like, you guys, it, it's usually there's some agreement with p- teams around, and now it's just everyone's like wide open. So that tells me things are going to get more interesting than ever. And with this format now, now of like they're going to be able to re- regroup and have a day two, like teams might be very aggressive to be like, we, we want to go back up and get this guy. Like, how is he still on the board? And it's going to be really interesting. I think everyone's a little skeptical of having two days for an NBA draft, but I think this year we'll see like, no, it's a good idea because teams might be more aggressive to zone in on some guys because they've had such little time when it comes to like, to make a pick in the second round. Like it goes so fast. I was like, you can't even get on the phone to make a trade. You're, you're all of a yeah, sudden like on the, you have to pick. So It'll yeah. be interesting. No, I agree. I think they you know, they learned a lesson from the NFL, man. Like you know, they they kind of devalued their product a little bit. The second round, I was like, okay, we're just getting this over with to make up the time in this case. But the NFL said, oh no, man, we're gonna have guys out here like the seventh round from you know from wherever from Montana, and we're gonna put it on ABC. Like really, and found yeah. that people will still watch a guy getting picked from Montana in the seventh round. <laughs> you know, you know. So like, I think the NBA is like, hey, wake up, guys. People are into this type of stuff, man. So especially even the second round, you still have a lot of known players in this case. Um, and one last thing from that point, at least from my side, is like, take the, for example, there's a lot of discussion in the Raptor world. Okay, we want a point guard that's going to organize the second unit. Fine. Jones, in this case, from Washington, Dias Jones, it seems like a, you know, like a, a, a great, real good option. But what's not to say in this case here, and Coach will like this, 
that if you're in the second round and say R.J. Davis is available, could he not supply that in this case, that a cheaper option in this case, to do the same thing? You know, like that that's the type of decisions I think that GMs and, and basketball operations start looking at. It's like, why am I going to overpay in this case to go get Jones in this case from Washington while well, looking for some other thing and give this kid a shot in this case who does exactly that type of stuff in college? And he's, you know, he's a junior or senior. Like, you know, I'm not sure Davis is going to go that high in the second round, but I'm saying that just use that him as an option, like, you know. I think there's a lot of guys in this class that could, if that's your philosophy, I think teams are going to think that way. I think there's a lot of guys this year, especially that could be like, Hey, we could go get this guy in the second round. That might be your backup point guard or our backup shooting. Guard. Like there's a lot of depth and, and it, that's why it's tough because everyone's quick to say like, this is a bad year. And it's like, no, it's, it's a bad year. If you need a franchise altering superstar, potentially there's not a Victor, there's not a Brandon Miller. There's not a scoot. Like, but if you need depth, if you need to build your team up, like get the foundation going a little bit, you could do some damage. You could find some really good pieces. Like coaches bring it up like Miami, like I'm terrified of three guys they're going to take because they're going to be home run picks for them. If they get them, like I'm like, they're in the perfect spot to get those guys. Like I love Tristan De Silva and I've talked with my co-host on the podcast, Tyler Metcalf and I'm like, He's going to end up in Miami, and him and Jaime Hawkins are going to just be perfect for them. Like, well, you sell there's guys like a cold sweat when it comes to Miami, anyhow. So every just- time they're on the clock, I puke. Like, my God, they're going to make the right pick. So <laughs> I'm just coming. saying, like, but that's the range in which Toronto could be right around their pick too. Like, you can find those pieces this year. I think that's why team like fan bases should get excited if you're picking later because you still can get pieces to to build the the ceiling of your team if you want to put it that way miami is your ac that's all you oh. know. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely Still um, got nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> hey every year miami is uh one that people should not uh forget people do forget yes. people do discount Hey man, Bucks and Celtics fans right now pray right now to get that 60. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I've talked to some Celtics writers and we talk about it, and I just said, just don't give me Miami right to start out the gate. I don't need Miami. Give me away from Miami. <laughs> so I'll uh just as we shift into the the final portion, yeah. um, I do want to say a couple things. You you mentioned stuff about the CBA. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was really interesting. You're right. On one hand, you want to stagger out your picks so that you're not paying everyone all at the same time. There's also value in having picks so that you can obviously, for lack of a better term, have cheap labor (laughs) in a sense. Uh, Guys who will more than likely outperform the value of their contract. And as I say on here, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you have the leverage to negotiate. So I I never ever say a guy's worth this or worth that. I always just say, hey, this is <laughs> this is just what it is. But what is interesting to me is you also mentioned that in the context of two days in the draft. For some front offices who seem to have a you know tough time under the clock, <laughs> under pressure. You're right. It is also interesting because you have a little bit more time to kind of negotiate. And especially this year when the CBA, the new CBA is coming in, everyone's getting their ducks in a row. Everyone's freaking out about, you know, what is the new TV deal, which is being you know negotiated right now is going to look like. It might be the best year to have two days in the draft. So, yeah, I don't know Absolutely. if you have any final yeah. thoughts on that. Um, and then after, I'll, we'll kind of shift into uh, just general questions uh, that from this from this uh, thread. No, I, th- I think it's a big it's a big year to have the two day format. It's almost a perfect year to have it because, you know. The second round's always tricky because there's always some players that you're like, why are they still on the board? Like. Trace Jackson Davis last year was a name that I was like, why is he still on the board? And then you kind of find out weeks later that there's some navigating to get that player somewhere. There might be some agent stuff. And I'm not saying it happened last year. There's just a lot of stuff that goes into the second round because I think it's so fast that teams are trying to figure out and teams are also trying to be like, hey, will you take a two-way contract if you don't get drafted? Like, There's a lot that goes on. So I think now teams get to regroup look at their board, be like, okay, wait, wait, we have this guy as a first-round pick. How is he still on the board? I think it's going to be really exciting to see 
especially with the CBA. And if teams are like, we have to find a guy that could get good value in the second round, because we see in every year, there's always a second round pick. They're like, Oh, redraft, like Gigi Jackson, like redraft. He's going way higher. And I think this year there could be a lot of those guys that I'm not saying are you're going to find Jimmy Butler all of a sudden in the second round, but I'm saying you might be able to find a, a really nice piece that, you know, is a fantastic value. And if, if Toronto keeps that second round pick, like it's going to be them ringing the dinner bell after the first day of being like, okay, who wants to come up and who knows? Maybe they, I don't think anyone's going to trade a 25 first for that, but you, you never know. Like maybe they could get some future assets or you get back and then you swing on a stash guy that comes over the following year. You never really know. Okay. So I'll, I'll, right now. Oh yeah. I need a declaration right now. Tyler triggered it for me. I'm saying it right now. Ronnie James of Golden State. Say it right now. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I can't. You just what I said about that negotiating stuff. And like they're up to five guys or they have four NBA fathers, okay? Five of them. Okay. True. We play that yeah, I count them every funny. year. Golden State definitely has a, a, a type. I'm just saying, right now, you know they love shooting. The kid can shoot. If you don't know, I'm just saying. He, it's going to be interesting with him. Um, <laughs> I saw him last Funny. year in Portland, and and he he's he's on the path defensively. Like he could be a really good defender, but it's just the rest of the game needs to come around. I just would like to see him get some more time. I don't want him to get thrown to the wolves, but we'll see. The the okay. pre-draft this year is going to be crazy. The, I also want to see. If, yeah, I also want to see for him. You know, kind of a full bit of time away from the injury i think yes. that that's something that you know for his sake and also you know just in general i think it's important to see that and it'll probably be important for you know potentially general managers but we will see um the other thing that i was going to say is it's interesting from a raptors perspective because we have someone with a team option that the team option does not have its due date until after the draft no so that is where it also gets interesting <laughs> to have a two-day draft because you might see more movement and even in the future you might see more of these type of situations come up so it's it's very interesting <laughs> we'll know what, how the negotiations are going based on who they draft <laughs> well, you, you never know yeah i'm just saying it, these stranger things have happened um but we move <laughs> <laughs> we move the NFL, into, NFL, at least you have free agency before the draft. Right. Like that, this, it makes perfect sense to me. But it, this is true. This is true. I mean, well, hey, we, we might be pushing eventually. towards that direction at some point. <laughs> okay. um, so I'll, I'll ask Beyond's question first, which is the excluding obviously Reed and Rob, and and you know, of course, there might be talk of Reed maybe uh, going oh, back yeah. for a, a second, you. second, uh, you know set of years uh in kentucky and of course reed shepherd's dad was a raptor for a brief preseason stint um, <laughs> um the question is is how many kentucky prospects do you think will potentially make the uh, make it into the first round specifically uh i could see justin edwards getting in there with a strong combine because he didn't have the great year but i could see teams kind of going on we know what he is, and the situation wasn't great. I, so he needs yeah, to go maybe, right. He, he needs to be able to go right first. <laughs> yes, he, need, he needs some. Work, I would like to see that growth. If if teams are like, "Hey, we still swinging on the upside," I could see it. Maybe Antonio Reeves, if he has just a tremendous combine, and teams are looking for a shooter, I, I would still say maybe Edwards. So I'll, I'll say three. I'll say. You made I think my dad as a Kentucky fan very happy about that guy. That's his dude. Man. <laughs> that Metcalf, guy. my co-host, loves Antonio Reeves. He's obsessed with them. So every time we do a mock draft, he's like, Antonio Reeves? Antonio Reeves? I'm like, no, move it on. <laughs> he's, he's um, good, though. He had a good year. Good year. Okay, let, let, let's get the fun, though, man. Let's talk about the two Kentucky guys. Let, let, let's get real about these two guys, man. Let's, yeah, let's... so before we go to any other questions, uh, of course, you take it away, Beyond. We've already oh. kind of covered them. Actually, stay yeah. tuned this week, people, because Rob Dillingham, that has oh. been edited and will be released. So, yeah. Okay. Let me hear some thoughts. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> All right, we could do a round table on this. Let's <laughs> start with first. Um, okay, let's go. Let me start with Dillingham. Okay, I can see like Dillingham to me smells like a six man off the bench just ready to cook. I see Lou Williams, like the, the personification of Lou Williams. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting there going like, okay, I have the guys like when we had our shows like. Do we really want to pick the top 10 pick? You're picking Lou Williams? Is that actually what you're telling me, right? That's what, you're, that's what you're telling me. I can't get over that. I don't get me wrong. I like Dillingham. I like the fact that he's kind of an old school mentality where he, he has no conscience of Chuck. In some ways, I actually appreciate that because when, when, when it's getting hot, Dill, I, I appreciate he didn't, he didn't care. He was still shooting with that game in the in the March practice in the tournament. But I'm sitting there going, like, okay, he can't cover, he can't guard his own shadow. And <laughs> and, and, and he's just pretty much a heat him up guy off the bench at this point. I don't see that guy running an offense. Now, the one team, I think you guys mentioned it in one of your pods or one of your shows, that he might be able to get away with it actually start is obviously we have my man Big Vic, who erases everything. So that might be the one place where he could potentially start. But this idea, I'm just shaking my head like, I'm like, yeah, as the years gone, I, like, I like the fact he had the talent to score, but I'm sitting there going, like, how is this guy a top 10 pick at this point, man? And I even get to his partner in crime, because let's get to him now. Okay. <laughs> I love this. This is fantastic. <laughs> his partner in crime now. <laughs> I was, the basketball I was a little more ball. bullish on Shepard earlier this season, but boy, I sat down here in my house, and my dad, Kentucky man, we watched that Tennessee game, the second one. And I said, like, he had a fantastic game. Last five minutes come. Tennessee starts ratcheting the defense. And my man's eyes look like a deer in headlights. I'm like, oh my goodness. Now, I mean, I, I sit there going, you know what? You know, you know, the pressure got to a little bit fine. You say, okay, it's a one-off. Then we get to the tournament. And he's throwing it in the fourth row. Folks are ducking here with their popcorn. I'm sitting there going, like, you can't even throw up an alley oop. The guy, you know, what's it? The European fellow there is like, what the heck is going on here? And I'm sitting there going like, I tell my dad, like, I really, if I'm him, he needs to stay in college a little bit longer because that ball pressure, if that's what's getting to him playing college, he ain't seen nothing yet when he gets to the NBA, you know, and guys are getting his grill at Brunson and stuff like that. I'm sitting there going, like, eh, I don't know, man. Like, for Shepard to be his, I, I, I get it, the shooting, the shooting, the shooting. I understand that. But at some point, I think at some point, I'm looking at it as, like, when does the other parts become diminishing you know, returns and the shooting can't cover it? You know, you can't paper over that. And I think my mind is that Shepard to me feels more like a mid-tier, like maybe 14, 15. Because I'm sitting there going like, okay, defensively, decent enough. Still some qualms, but not not Dillingham level. And offensively, I don't know if he could get to the rim as well as, you know, I think the, the athleticism might become a bit of an issue in the next level where it's like, okay, can you get the rim and finish around the rim when you're dealing with guys like Wemby or Chet or whomever it may be? I'm like, eh. So I, I guess I, I think the Kentucky guys are interesting, I, you know, of like where they sit and everyone's boards because I honestly some you know some of you guys have them in the top ten. I think I'm a little less bullish on them as time's gone on. And I see them more in the teens personally. That's where I see them. So I would love to hear your thoughts on on um, you know the um, you know the um, the partners in crime in this case in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, I I'm pretty much on the same path with you with Rob. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> I I think he's very gifted offensively. I think there's some really fun stuff. I didn't think he was going to take this type of a step with, with his playmaking this year. I thought he was just going to be the bucket getter. Like, oh, we need offense. Like the Lou Williams thing, really, I can't shake it. Everyone I talk to around the league loves him, which is just like, like one executive told me, he's like, I got him in my top three. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, who is he guarding? Like, I like I watched him. <laughs> Gonzaga played them in Kentucky, and Gonzaga literally was just like calling him out. Like, okay, we're going at Rob. So, I if he goes to San Antonio, yes, you have a big help right behind you, a very large human being. I get that, but I just don't. I still love like the idea, like you're saying, of him going and being like this dangerous Lou Williams type of asset off your bench that makes a lot of sense to me i could get on board with that um i just i don't know if i'm taking him very i have him closer to 10 which i'm sure is gonna drive people crazy because i just understand if you believe i understand the excitement of why you're buying in he is not six three i'm telling you right now <laughs> kentucky does great is there stuff anyone's with the measurements? anyone like to hear more than his <laughs> he, it's he 
someone was every scout is like, there's he's not six three. There's no way. And then um I think OTE, he was like six one and a half in shoes. Yeah. So I will be shocked if he grew an inch and a half. Right. Um but I like him. I, I think he's really, really talented offensively. It's just the fit. It, it, yeah. This it, the draft's always about fit, and it's so important this year. Reed, I really like. I think all the questions are are warranted. I know some teams love him. Some teams are eh. Some teams think he could be a point guard. Um, we had a we had a big scout this year, be, like beginning of the year. He's like, I think he's Steve Nash. And I was like, Whoa, Whoa. where are we coming from that? Whoa. And then you start watching. <laughs> I'm like, Well. I get it if you're thinking like, oh, he can get to the mid range. He gets to his spots. He understands how to play. Obviously, it wasn't the best exit interview for him. <laughs> like <laughs> Just watching, like, but there I like how you put that. <laughs> yeah, it's like there was times this year um, where you're like, holy crap, this kid can what? play. So I thought coming into the year. I watched him at the McDonald's All American game. I was like, this kid's going to play at Kentucky for a couple of years and be a really good NBA player. Mm-hmm. And I did not expect the opening months of the year. I was like, is Reed going to be in this class? Like, what's going on? I kept waiting for him to just get cold. And I was like, he's still shooting 50, 50, 88. Like, what's going on? So I don't know. The problem is with all these guys, how much better can you get with next year's class? Is legit like it is worth the hype it is crazy deep there's psychotic talent it's so how much better can your potential stock get like i don't know reed could be going top 10 i don't know if he could be going top 10 next year no matter what he does like what else can he do and and that's where things are going to get interesting with a lot of these guys they like there's a lot of guys that are testing the waters or thinking about it that are like should i go back i'm like First of all, don't ask me. Second, right. like, how much better can you get? That's next right. Year? Don't consult with, like, me. <laughs> don't ask me. This is your life, not exactly. me. So, like, you made my point too, just yeah. right now about Reed Shepard, because I know Beyond has said about maybe he should go back another year. Yeah, he might get a little bit better, but you've just said it. Twenty twenty five, it's going to probably look like twenty twenty three draft class a little bit. Well, and I'm not. Yes. Yeah, I'm not suggesting you go back. That's the word coming out of Kentucky for what oh, we yeah, right. Oh, right. Yeah. So I agree with you two. I think this is the year he's got no choice. Come out now because let's face it. I joked about Bronny, but this is the only draft Bronny could get away doing this. It's the only draft he can't do this next year or the year after. <laughs> this is the only draft he can get away with what he's doing right now. LeBron's probably like, I don't got that much time left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's only but, so many times I can go in the chamber and add a couple, you know, months to my life. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think I think coach is spot on. Like it, Colin Murray Boyles is a guy that got really hot at the end of the year. He said in a post game interview, he's like, I'm coming back. Well, he's been asking around about his stock. That tells you everything. Like guys are like. Like guys like that, I'm like, are you gonna so- suddenly shoot 35 percent after you barely shot it this year from three? Like, how much better are you gonna get your draft stock in a really talented class? So I think there's gonna be a lot of names that are testing the waters that might shock us and stay in because you know you you just might not really make a lot of momentum with one more year. It, it's it's a fascinating curveball for this season. Well, look at some of the guys we're talking about right now, right? Be it Edie. Or or, or or Klingon or um or even what's his name? I just I just slipped my mind just now. Um, Lebowski. Lebowski yeah. went right out last year and said, you know what? You might people say you might be a late first round pick at best. It's like okay, I'm back to do because everyone knew this draft here. Like if you were gonna make make hey, essentially this is the draft to come out in if you were kind of like a bit borderline. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we'll see. He. He might be slipping a little bit. I don't know. Right. He might be right back where you see. Yeah, yeah, he went true. to the he went to the DJ booth and really had some struggles. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. We'll see though. No. I, I mean, I don't know. It's a really it's a crazy year, and that's why it's even more exciting. It, it's it's tough for fans to get excited about, for, but for like evaluators, it's really exciting because you're like you have all these debates of like, well, they should stay because. I don't know if they're going to get into the top 20 next year. They might be going 23rd this year. So it's a lot of names. And a exec I talked to was like, the combine is as big this year as ever. Like the pre-draft process workouts. He's like, we, 
I have no idea. And I'm like, you usually spot on right now. He's like, I have no idea what names I would have up there right now. He's like, it's going to be humongous this year. Just that final point. You just said a big, uh, the, the combine. You're one of beyond guys last year who was Canadian made it huge in the combine. Omax in Dallas. And he popped himself up to a first round pick. So it yep. sounds like based on what you're saying that the combine this year, who's, who's going to be that Omax that's going to do, or maybe there's a couple of guys, for example, that can have the potential to do that. It's interesting what you said. Yeah. You know. And even the year before, um, you know, Leonard Miller said, Mm-mm, I'm going to wait. Yes. And it ended up being a, a, a fairly good decision. So, I mean, you, you never know. We'll see how, how high uh, Minnesota goes. He might end up, uh, you know, get, uh, you, you know, although on the bench, <laughs> you know, maybe Minnesota makes it all the way. So you never know. Well, and this year they're making a, a rule. You have to, you can't hide anything. Like you got to go to the combine. You got to measure. Yes. Other yes. years, like agents would steer away and like hide the medicals for specific. This year, they're like, no, you have to do it. You have to measure your everything. That's one like, thing I really like. Actually, big deal. About it's this. it's fantastic, and it's also like everyone's going to be like, when's Dillingham getting measured? When's Reed Shepard getting measured? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's just, everyone's going to be <laughs> excited. There's like ten guys, and I'm like, I want to know what their measurements are. So, and then like clinging with his medical is the foot fine. Like, there's a lot of curveballs about some certain stuff. Like, I've seen Ron Holland listed six 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 eight like. Six, seven. I've seen it everywhere. So there's a lot of uncertainty with some of these guys. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, I'm going to just quickly hit on some of these uh, okay. you know, tw Twitter th thread questions. Some of them I'm going to just combine because they're kind of similar. So um, I'll give a shout out to both Banton app. Um, so Japanese Jafar. <laughs> it's always fun reading handles. Yes, and Stevie, which is, uh, you know, Raptors Shack. Uh, they basically asked a similar question, which is basically outside of the lottery or outside of SAR. Do you see anyone as having like all NBA, uh, you, you know, level potential or, you know, outside of the lottery who can out best outplay their, their draft position in your opinion? Oh this is tough because I, we already said it's a, it's a, it's a flat draft. So, yeah. <laughs> um, all NBA. All NBA yeah. is, is I'll, I'll, I, I'll give my thoughts on this. Okay. Is, uh, okay. I, I, I don't see many. No, I don't either. No. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't sugar. You see, you see like, him swipe see the thing to next year. Oh, wait, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. yeah like 20, oh, 24. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> there, those boozer twins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know about, I mean, all NBA, uh, Bazellus, maybe if things start clicking, if he starts shooting like he did in high school, maybe uh, Ron Holland, maybe down the road, but I, I he's got a long way to go. As I think still, maybe Khalil Ware. I, I, the, it's a weird year for like, I don't think you're getting stars. I think you could get star rotation guys, like guys that really know how to play their role really well. But like, I don't know about all NBA. I, I don't see anyone right now that I'm like, oh, they're going to be one of the best bigs. Like, I don't know. Now, so, I, uh, I would say no. I would say no. Um, I'll be I'll you, be buzzkill. Go ahead, coach. A, a follow up question to what the Kenyan just had asked you because the question was, do you think anyone outside of Sar could be all NBA? Do you think Sar could be all NBA? And how much time do you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my problem is we, we talked about this earlier, like the ignite never have those showcase games. They have right. one. Mm -hmm. And if you get that version of SAR playing against the ignite, now everyone can make a joke like, Oh, it was against the ignite. He's mm -hmm. he rose to the occasion because he understood the audience, like who was watching him, who was in the stands. If you get that SAR, yeah, I could see an all NBA. I didn't get that SAR from the rest of the year of watching him in the NBL. Now, very physical league, very tough for a teenager to be inserted in there that's thin framed, despite how you know impressive he is running the court and his defense is fantastic. I think he's got a long way to go offensively. 
there's so many good bigs in the league right now. So, I mean, I, I think he could get there. I think he's going to require some, some serious patience. Like I know everyone, uh, number one pick, he's not going to be Victor women. Yama. So everyone needs to throw that out the door right away. Like, but I think he could get there. It just might take the realistic path instead of Victor just breaking every record as a rookie. I think it's, it's Sar could get there. It's just going to take a couple of years. Actually, one of the debates that we've had um, behind the scenes is like, is he a center? And that's that's also another question for that. Is just Great like question. his his pathway towards success, um, which is why I, I like him at a number one. Is there's more pathways to mold him into the whatever, um, it, you know. Whereas if a guy, it's like this is what you have to do, and then you also have to look at how is how reasonable is it for him to build X, Y, and Z skill set. For him, I think there's so much uh, that defensive potential it's hard to always you know translate that from there to the nba but it looks very tantalizing yeah the, the um, defense is nuts like yes. the defense is really really impressive like i, mean, I saw him like flip his hips like twice on a guard and then didn't get beat because that's a, that's the thing i've seen guys get beat and then the, oh you sorry Raptors fans. Scotty is a good example. Scotty gets, he hedges up way too high at times and then he gets beat. He's a little cocky with it because he knows that he has enough. His, it's not his first step, it's his second step where he can just recover and just be in a re good recovery position and erase the mistake. Right, right. But you, you don't always want to be in recovery. And I saw Sar not really needing to be in recovery that often. But then he also can recover. It was really impressive. Absolutely, it, it, the defense is really special. Like it, that's why I think so many people are buying into him being the number one guy. Is because I'm also one of those like, if you can be an elite defender potentially at that size, you can find a way to play in the NBA for a long time. Absolutely, S strength is also something I think is very overlooked sometimes like we yes. don't underappreciate strength in you, th that is needed in the nba level you need to be able to play with grown men who are much bigger than you and you know you don't come in all the time as a big with dwight howard's physique like so his body needs to fill out and it was great that he played in the nbl but i think it's just going to take some time with them the defense is special the offense needs work. The field needs work. The body needs work. So I just think it's going to be whoever's taking him is going to be like, let's be patient with him. Let's let's take the long road here. But I definitely think he could get to that level. It's just going to take some time. It's one of the things that we've talked about in both on spaces here and everywhere, really. It's just depending on, say, the Raptors get, you know, if there's ever a draft the Raptors are going to get number one in, it'll be this draft. And, uh, sure. you know, Andrea. Uh, it's no. a good problem to have. It's a good problem to it, have, it, I promise. It, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, what I tell people is that the impact that a first-year player in any draft is going to have, you have to just be mindful that it just, you know, you shouldn't be expecting 10 wins added to your win total just like that. Um, regardless of the, 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 the draft, you know, it just, it's really, it, it takes time to get used to, you know, whether it be moving to a place that you've never been to, cause some of these guys are international, you know, now being and, you know, situated without your family, whether it be, you know, playing against guys that are now, you're not the biggest guy. It's, it's like going from, you know, I think the best way to explain is, for those of you who are top of your class, and then you go from high school, you now go to college, and you're like, I'm just a normal person. And now I have to raise, you know, rise up the ranks academically. It's kind of the same sense in terms of, you know, but on the court. So, um, you know, I, I just always preach a little bit of patience for, for, for uh, you know, the viewers. Um, I We're almost done the question, so... Uh, one is just if the well, one is just about tanking. It's just like which tank next year? I'm just this is a shout out to James Welch. I, I I I'm shortening the question, but it's basically if they ended up with the pick, does it does it force them to tank next year? Uh, you know, 
Uh, and then are the Raptors smart to rebuild with two starters who are not too, too good, who are not too good defenders? Um, so yeah, I I don't know if you want to just be pro tank or next or not tank next year, but that that's the the question. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah, I'd probably be pro tank. No, I don't. I mean, I don't know. Next year's it's special. a nice draft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting to see a lot of those guys next week in Portland. Like I get to see, so I'm sure if you guys ask me next week, I might be like, "Yeah, full tank. Go ahead, like just <laughs> just just tank as much as you can." Like, um, but it, it's tough. It's tough now to like tank because you also when you're rebuilding, you want to play these young guys. You want to get them reps. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to be respectful. I'm not just saying like, "Oh, Toronto Absolutely. full rebuild." I'm just saying when you're trying to get that team foundation back up higher um the, obviously you want the superstar swings but um you know it's going to be interesting a lot of teams next year are going to be looking at the top it's, it's a fun class so the final question and, and and i by the way i agree i i always say this you traded an all nba player regardless of whether people like the all nba player or not because there's some debate about in raptors fans saying you know some people feel like it was a you know addition by subtraction, and I'm like, well, the record says otherwise. But <laughs> just saying, you know, it's uh, it's getting kind of dark, to, you know, not that long ago. It's tough to get accurate value for an all NBA guy, so I, you usually lose that it, trace. So. Exactly, you know, going back to the top of the the pod, you know, we did win one one this week for one, so that that was that was good, that was good. But uh, it, you usually do that to have the best chances if, if you're worried about as people would say you know your peak being kind of a middling peak the whole point is to build as much talent so that you could have the best window even if you're making that window a little bit further along and so you know i'm of the mindset that you know whether it's this draft or the next draft and also just in my opinion, I don't think that the Raptors are going to be really tremendously better next year. Growth takes time. I think it's going to take a little bit more time, and I'm okay with that. Um, but the next question, as we add on to what I just said, is uh, <laughs> this is going to come up. So I'm not going to say the person's last name just because I don't want to mispronounce it. This is from Facebook. But Joe uh, said, what are the chances that Edie becomes a Raptor? There's always going to be an ED question. I would warn everyone that everyone needs to be on ED watch. I think every fan base does. Um, <laughs> I'm just telling you, I've heard some numbers <laughs> with him that I'm like, crap. Like, I'm just, oh my gosh. Like, you I gotta I've heard, the podcast this, okay? You got to do this episode that. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've, I've heard. But some, the old crap or the. Uh, <laughs> everyone, everyone needs to go to EU watch. <laughs> I'm just telling you, there's teams that love him. There's teams that love him. And it's not just a couple, it's a lot. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a little wild. I am lower on the ED train. I still believe, like, if you got him as a rotation piece, he could be really, really effective. I don't know if I'm still, and, and I'm fine with that. If I, hey man, I'm, on I'm that wrong, train with you, man. don't worry uh, about I it. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, <laughs> you the guys water, are the water's plenty or? fine. Yeah, yeah, we're with you. Trust okay. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're in the water with you. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, <laughs> the water's great. I'm never leaving. So, like, I, I just, he's a, a really good player. I think his conditioning this year has been way better. Mm -hmm. Um, He's been fantastic. I just am still, I don't see a team reinventing their game because of Edie. Like, I, I think if you brought him and you're playing him with bench teams, then maybe. I don't know about him going to Toronto. It doesn't make sense to me. If he's on the board with their second first round pick. Right. I, maybe it might make sense because uh. my biggest belief with Edie all year is I think some team's going to say, if it's going to work, it's going to work for us. And if you've got multiple picks, that makes sense to, hey, you got your guy early. <clears throat> Why right. not? What if what if it works and your, your guy that you get earlier in the draft clicks and you also have Edie as a fantastic piece? I get that. I just, if I'm picking in the lottery and I'm looking at Edie, I'd be, oof. You know where Edie You going. miss, you might not have a job. Like, th that's all I'm thinking, like, I, 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 I don't know. I, I get bet you this is where Edie lands. Edie's gonna land on a contender 
that is saying, okay, we don't have enough to deal with said big that's that's a dominant big, and we could get six fouls out. So if you're in this case, you know, Tyler's favorite team that plays in you know in New England, they might say, hey, you know what? We can play Embiid you know, four times a year and probably the playoffs. We just want six fouls. Come on board, son. That so, is the right so Beyond's mock draft is Edie thirtieth. <laughs> no, but that's the thing we're talking about. Same thing with Denver, right? Like that's yep. what you're seeing. You're playing. Yep. You're team sitting there going like, okay, well, we we all if OKC doesn't have a center and they say, you know what, we just need six fouls on Jokic. Okay, here you go. That's what Chicago used to do for years with Jordan. They used to grab any guy they could get. You know, Bill Wayne to whoever's like, okay, we're playing Patrick Ewing. We got eighteen fouls to deal with, guys. <laughs> Actually, I'll, it makes I'll give you another team, Phoenix. There's another yes. one. Right. It makes you know it's like uh, Nurkic, those knees. If you, if you have a bunch of sh <laughs> if you have a bunch of scoring around him, I get it. It makes yeah. sense. It's just if you're drafting Edie to be like, okay, there's our starting five. I'm like, eh, I don't know. But if you're like, hey, we're gonna put him as our backup big playoff series, he can just beat somebody up and get us some fouls, or he's gonna play against bench lineups. I get it. If you're rolling the dice, I am just even in a weak class. I'm not taking that in the lottery. So Do you feel similar about I uh, it, I know there is a difference, but between him and Klingon, I know you're you guys are high on Klingon, but just in terms I, I, of the, the archetype for the Raptors, I should say specifically. I think Klingon can move much better. I think Klingon's playmaking is mm -hmm. really underrated. Like I think it's, yeah, it's I was something I was that's impressed to get unlocked. Yes. Dude. Um, I I like Klingon a lot. Klingon just got he's got to pass this medical. If the foot's fine, you know Hurley said earlier in the year when he banged his foot up twice that like they weren't related. Okay, prove it. If it's if it's healthy, then he's got the tools to be really special. Um, and, and the playmaking and the defensive versatility because I think he can move a little bit better than some suggest. I mean he's huge, but I think he can move. I think his instincts are strong. Edie, I think, is just a a force with, you know, gets a rebound. He's got the ability to go right back up and doesn't require much jumping. So, I mean, he's just a huge human being, but um, so, that's why I, I have Kling and, you know, I think he's a top five guy, if healthy, if healthy. So, Tyler, I mentioned this to the guys, my philosophy when it comes to certain programs. I say sometimes certain programs have a tax on them. I put like a Gonzaga tax, right? I always question this case here, like what we're really seeing. And then you also got to deal with the health issues with a lot of Zaga guys. So I always put, you know, Duke for years had a Duke tax in my mind. I would, I gotta flip it the other way in this case here. There's a UConn rebate in this case if you want to call it. That way. I like that. <laughs> That's right. You, UConn guy, you can be good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. There's, there's <laughs> programs where it's like that dude with Villanova, we're gonna be straight. You know, for years the yes. target like that too. You pick a guy from North Carolina, you're gonna be all right. So there's certain programs like I don't even worry about the foot because it's a UConn dude. He's gonna be good. <laughs> hey. That's a good point. Nova, there was years where NBA teams were like, oh, he's going to be ready to play. He's a right. Nova guy. Like, and it was right. just like, that's how easy you're thinking it is. Like, it, 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 but it's, it's, they know how to play. They were taught right. Like, a lot of those guys were staying multiple years. Like, it makes sense when you're, when you're buying into a culture, when you're, when you're understanding what they had to, to go through. Like, I, um, I read an article before we did this pod about Stefan Castle and Hurley was like, it was, a phenomenal recruiting process because he's just like, I've never won. I want to be a winner. I want to learn how to be a winner. And then like Hurley was like, well, we're going to go back to back. And it was just like, all right, I'm in. And he, and Hurley was just like, well, there was no drama. He was just bought into like, I don't need to score. I don't need to do this. I just want to be a winner. I want to learn. And it's just like, that's all I need to hear. And it's like NBA teams will drool over that. If he's just like, what do I got to do to win? What do I got to do to help out? Um, yeah, and I think you get point. that with guys. They slept on it. They slept on the Villanova guy last year. Mr. Whitmore seems to be doing all right right now. Uh, yeah. right? I, I'm, I'm still shocked that he, he uh, before coach goes, I'll just say one point about uh, Edie, um, which is that the first time I saw Edie in depth at like, you know, a higher level of league was FIBA. And yes. that was interesting. 
late night games for a lot of us. <laughs> was, They're always fun. Was, uh, some of these games are at like four or five in the morning. I remember a, a friend of mine, he, he was streaming all the games and he, he was uh, halfway asleep. I had to text him like, dude, you're falling asleep, man. <laughs> so shout out to him. I uh, is uh, Toronto Hoop Talk. Uh, oh. You know, we'll have him on the pod at some point, uh, hopefully not 4 a.m. But uh, yeah, when we were playing and i can't remember which team it was one of the early teams that more in the exhibition phase germany? and sorry which one germany no this is pre-germany and we were although we, we played them a lot uh we had to basically play zone for ed that concerned me now FIBA is a bit different of course but when you have to and he has slimmed down for sure um from what I've heard, you know, I don't have those measurements, but I, I just worry about that at the next level. And I think for a team like the Raptors, where we need that backline defense, we lost the hypothetical defense of someone that I really liked and that all of us were really high on, which is, you know, Pac-12 award winner, Coloco, uh, you know, you need something. And what was so special about Coloco, in my opinion, was his foot speed. You know, his ability, he was, he was actually quite light on his feet. Um, I'll, I'll tell you something after, but there's, I'm very big on uh, body control, uh, you know, light footedness. There's, there's an athletic background there. That's, you know, the reason why. And I just, I don't know if I see that from Edie. Coach, you were going to say something. And we'll, uh, we'll ask Tyler after, uh, if he wants to plug his stuff, of course. Yeah. Well, with Edie, I mean, if this was 1997, maybe he's perfect for the NBA. But in 2024, the way that Steph Curry and Dirk Nowitzki, Dirk Nowitzki in terms of modernizing the seven-footer shooting threes today, um, man, that's a huge risk, as Tyler just said. Because if, if you pick him high and it doesn't turn out, you're losing your job. And what Kenny was kind of pointing out in, in FIBA, I remember, I want to say they were playing maybe Germany, actually, when they had was it? Uh, uh, Tice and, and Franz on the floor. Those guys just went five out. Edie was useless, quite frankly. Or they would get him in mismatches with, i.e., a Dennis Schroeder at the time. And he Dennis is so quick, he just took him off the dribble. So if I'm a team and I'm playing planning against him in this NBA, I mean, we saw it last uh, two years ago, and Beyond will like this. Dallas is playing Utah. <laughs> go Bears under the hoop, and he's having to go out and guard Kleba. Dallas went five out, took Go Bear completely out of the game. Either Go Bear had to go out and challenge Kleba for three, or if that if he kept you know sliding out towards the three because Kleba just made three threes in a row. Now the rim's open. Edie. I get it. If he's a late first round or second round pick, fine. I, I think maybe there's an argument there. Man, you get this guy before 20, that's a risk. I'm sorry. It's just going to be a risk. No, I, I completely agree. I think if you're if you ha if you're drafting him and you're a contender and you're you know, if you're like Boston, which I've heard they like him, which is scary. I'm sorry, I put that thought in your mind there. No, I've heard they like him, so that's why I'm terrified. I'll just tell you guys, I've heard they like him a lot, which I'm like, okay, somebody else draft them. But like that makes sense where you're like, we have all these pieces. Now, if we could play him and just throw him at you, not every night, but like dependent on playoff series and stuff, I get that. But if you're drafting him to play like like coach is saying, like I, I think you just get destroyed in the playoffs because well, playoff teams will just pick him apart. And um, the uh, the one real quick thing I wanted to say, it's amazing you guys brought up the FIBA stuff because Corey at No Ceilings <coughs> is the is the ED guy, and he's been bugging me all year to buy in. And he said, "Go watch his limited FIBA stuff. He looked good." So now I'm gonna be like, "Well, Corey, you're oh, yeah. full of it." I got three witnesses. Let's put that with you. Germany or Spain? It was one of those. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I gotta check that out now. All right. Because yeah. because I think later in the tournament they didn't they didn't continue. They didn't play. They, well, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah. Eight, we edge him. We even bothered playing a center as a backup at that point. By the time we got to the the, 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 the knockout round, but I just on a side note the Boston thing. I mean, let's face it, it's the India connection. You know that's oh for sure. It's, it's, <laughs> yes. Boy, like, I know, but... Brad Stevens. You're not slick. Come on. <laughs> you're not fooling anyone. <laughs> but, but Kenny Smith. 
on TNT said, can a team play traditional basketball for six minutes a half? Can they? I mean, I don't nobody know. really does that anymore. I mean, no. you go through women's, you go through men's, everybody's launching threes. It doesn't matter if you're six foot or you're seven foot. It doesn't matter today. And you kind of question the foot speed with Edie being able to recover. Or th- take a Drew Holiday if you get switched up on him. Now what's going to happen? Exactly. I just don't, I can't see it. And that's yeah, why I'm. I get every every class. There's a guy where I'm like, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And it, with Edie, it's just people are like, why are you so low on him? And I'm like, I'm not low on him. I just would take him in this range. Like this is the value for me. Yes. If I got him late first, early second, and I'm like, I'm fine with that. You, you guys can get mad at me that I don't have Edie in my lottery. I'm gonna sleep exactly. fine tonight. There, there's you know, of course a I Canadian. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of people really like Edie because he's Canadian and yes. I uh, Tyler, you know who my guy was like yeah. that last year? <laughs> you're still killing him out, but I think I'm winning so far is Scoop. That was my guy last year. I, uh, Scoop's hey, gonna be I'll fine. I'll take it. Folks. I'll, I'll Scoop's take that L. Scoop is gonna be fine. <laughs> gonna be fine. I'm, I'm not looking, worried about Scoop. I'm looking good right now. <laughs> I'm not worried about Scoop. Don't it, he's a hard worker. I'm not worried about it. Um, yes. I, I think he'll work t- out too. <laughs> yeah. It's uh <laughs> It's tough you guys brought up Coloco because that was my guy yeah. for years. Yeah. Like I saw him when he was barely playing. I was like, this kid's going to figure it out. And then I, I the health stuff was just like, ugh, because I thought he was going to be a really good piece for Toronto when they drafted him. I was like, that's a steal. They're going to get think a good he's, one. He's, I think we saw that when we did our preseason with the Raptors. We thought he was the guy who was going to unlock this team, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. It's been a rough season. Tough one. Yeah, so that, was, that probably was probably the precursor how this season was gonna go. But, <laughs> but what a way to what a way to start you, it. <laughs> look where you guys got him, and that maybe you find someone like that this year. Like they, that's why those early picks mm-hmm. could get so valuable mm-hmm. um, in years like this. So I don't know. It'll, it'll be interesting. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for for stopping by and joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, of course, on you know, on on this podcast, and uh, where can people find you beyond, you know, down below in the in you know the description? Um, I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter, I guess X, uh, Tyler yeah. underscore Rucker, <laughs> and then uh, no ceilings NBA.com. It's absolutely free, and we've got stuff going on uh, five days a week. So, thank you guys for having me on. This was a blast. Anytime you want to talk draft or even just the Raptors, I'm here. Absolutely, we'll definitely have have you back if you, if you'll come back, oh, and easy, uh, easy. <laughs> you know, and that's 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 a wrap. So everyone, uh, like, comment, subscribe, check his stuff out, and any of the links that are are relevant. Again, description down below. Thank you, everyone. And take care and peace.